Good afternoon, and thank you for that too kind introduction. Um, today, we will be talking about pain, living with pain in CF, and I just wanted to start by asking you some opening questions. Um, so, and I think some of you are people with CF, many of you are family members, so think about your loved ones as well. Um, think about some of the different pain that you have felt. What was the worst pain you have ever experienced? And have you ever experienced physical pain from something that you knew was not from a physical cause? I would love to have a discussion about this, but in this format, I think maybe we'll just go on with our talk and I'll take questions at the end. So some of the goals of our talk today are to understand the prevalence of pain and sources of pain in cystic fibrosis. And I would love to get more insight from all of you at the end if there are things that I've missed, um, things that I didn't talk about. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some things to help understand the potential complex mechanisms of pain in cystic fibrosis identify some of the challenges to the use of opioids to treat pain and other distressing symptoms in CF, outline an approach to the use of opioids, and then talk about alternative pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches to pain management. So I always like to start with a case. Um, this is a young woman, 35 years old. She has CF and she has chronic pain. She's got pain in her muscles, most in her in her legs, and she describes it primarily as bone pain. She also has pain in her arms, and she feels that it is worst in her forearms rather than her upper arms. She's got abdominal pain with occasional nausea and constipation, but she has no pancreatic insufficiency. She also has chest wall pain, worse with coughing and, of course, with airway clearance, and she has severe menstrual cramps for which she is planning a hysterectomy. So complicated, right? Sound familiar at all to any of you? Here are some other things. She works 50 hours a week in a busy office. Her work has really been ramping up, and while her pain, uh, while her work has been ramping up, her pain has been getting worse also. She used to exercise, but now because she's working so much, she doesn't get to exercise at all anymore. Or, you know, rarely, weekends maybe. And she has difficulty sleeping. She's only able to sleep about four hours per night. She's struggling. She says she's not stressed out, but she just can't sleep. And she's got two kids who are elementary school age. I think they were six and eight or eight and ten, something like that. So lots of stuff going on in this young woman's life and lots of stuff going on in every single one of your lives, I am sure. So we'll talk a little bit about pain. I think all of you kind of know what pain is. I imagine there's nobody in this room who has never experienced any pain, but we'll give a little definition. Um, pain, and this is from Wikipedia, one of my favorite highly scientific sources, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, so the potential is important, or described in terms of such damage. So there may not be actual damage, but it feels like it. A little more scientific here, we're going to talk about different types of pain. So nociceptive, that means it has to do with actual receptors, and we've got chemical, thermal, and mechanical receptors that can be potential uh, nerve sites of pain. So chemical receptors, that's when you have, a lot of times, people with cancer experience pain from their chemical receptors, the evil humors that are released by the cancer. There are things in CF that can cause that when you're, um, the Osteoarthropathy of CF can cause some chemical pain. Thermal pain, that's easy. You're touching a hot pot, a fire, a coal, whatever, that's thermal receptors. And then mechanical receptors, that's when you actually sustain an injury of some sort, something hits you. And neuropathic pain is totally different. Neuropathic pain is when there's damage or disease that actually affects the nerves. So nothing on the outside, nothing that you can see or touch or uh, really um, measure, but the nerves are damaged and it feels like pins, needles, burning, that kind of stuff. It's nerve damage. can be due to um, chronic injury, chronic medication use, things like that. Okay, and then acute and chronic pain. Acute pain, you stubbed your toe, ouch, it hurts, sudden onset, usually due to an injury of some sort, something that's that you can 
you can note distinctly, this is when it set off, or you know, maybe it's gout, but you know it's something very specific. Now, chronic pain, this usually lasts beyond what, how long it's expected for your injury to heal. And it goes on and on, and it's not getting better. It actually, there is a disease state, chronic pain syndrome, where um, the body develops different coping mechanisms, or the body develops different mechanisms to respond to pain, and the treatment is very different from the treatment for acute pain. There may not be an identifiable cause, but there is change in the body chemistry. All right, so we'll talk about CF specifically. Pain is very common. Um, up to 75% of patients in several studies have been reported to have pain in CF. Actually, in one study in 1996, every single one of the patients reported pain, and 84% of them reported that it was serious. In this other study in 1999, 24% of patients reported no pain at all. So there's lots of variable reports of severity, frequency, and the impact on life. Many CF patients will experience acute, chronic, or procedural pain that can be in the chest, abdomen, back, limbs, or head. And pain measurement is complex. Have You guys have been to the doctor. They've asked you what kind of pain you have with the children. You've got the faces scale. You've got the numbers. We can go on and on about the different scales there are. Um, some of them are go from red to green. They've got this uh, veteran scale that they use in the hospital. I can't even keep up with all of them. So the important thing, though, for you guys is that pain and CF can lead to disability. So recreation, are there things in life that you'd want to do? You want to play, you want to play sports, you want to hike, you want to go outside? You can't do it due to your pain. Are there uh, problems in school or work, social activities that are being avoided due to pain, family responsibilities that are hard to keep up with, sexual activity, and self-care. Um, pain can lead to depression, anxiety, I think those are common things with everybody, but even more difficult when living with a chronic serious illness, interference with therapies, especially airway clearance, which can be quite painful. Um, pain can lead to pulmonary exacerbations, worsening those if um, people with CF are unable to do their therapies. Pain can lead to sleep disturbance and decreased survival. So pain is important. It, it can be a big deal. There is no definite association of pain with lung disease severity. So good lung function, poor lung function, it doesn't matter. Everybody is at risk. Um, but the presence of pain is associated with treatment burden. That could have a lot of meanings, and we'll explore that a little bit more in detail. And treatment-related pain is more common than general pain in people with CF. So, you know, treatment related, related to airway clearance therapy, related to procedures that people undergo for their CF. Okay, so back to the assessment of pain. When you go and your doctor's asking you about things, how does it feel? We talked about the nociceptive pain. Somatic pain is closer to the surface. Um, those chemical and, or the thermo and uh, mechanical receptors we were talking about earlier. Visceral pain is that deep central pain. It's deep inside, it's in my belly, you can't really touch it and point at it, it's, it's in there. And um, they have very different mechanisms as well. And then neuropathic pain, as I said before, it's due to the nervous system activation. In terms of medications, we will talk in more detail about these. Non-opioid analgesic, so an analgesic is a pain medication, medication that decreases pain. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs great drugs for people with good kidney function and who don't have ulcers. So those are two caveats um, for high risk of using NSAIDs. And ibuprofen and naproxen are probably the two most common NSAIDs. Um, and ibuprofen has its own whole other conversation in CF. And acetaminophen is uh, the drug name for Tylenol, which is a great medication for many people, but there are risks associated with it as well. In terms of adjuncts, adjuncts means an additional medication to use on top. These do not treat the pain specifically, but they can be added on in addition 
to help decrease the pain and to help in the management of it. So neuropathic agencies are agents that target the nerves and antidepressants. Well, I'm not depressed, you might say, but these antidepressants change the chemistry in the body that affects the experience of pain. All right, so the neuropathic, the nerve agents specifically, there are two that are common. These are gabapentin, which was originally designed as an anti-seizure medication, and pregabalin, or Lyrica, which is a newer generation of uh, gabapentin. And these are commonly used to treat conditions such as fibromyalgia and also other types of chronic pain that be, may be nerve-related. They work very well. They do have side effects, primarily drowsiness. People may feel like it makes their mind a little bit foggy. Antidepressants are great. Like I said, they help in the perception of pain, and also they work with the nerves, with the neurotransmitters and the chemicals inside the body that um, affect the sensation of pain. So the tricyclic antidepressants are an old class of drugs, and these are often also used for people with insomnia because they help with sleep or they induce drowsiness, depending on which uh, side of the book you're coming from. The ones that I tend to use more often are the top two, amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Um, Dizipramine and imipramine I personally have not prescribed as often. These are great because they are old, they're cheap, they're easy to access, as opposed to Lyrica, which is a new, well-tolerated, but very expensive drug. And serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, these are called SNRIs. And the two drugs in this class that we use to help with pain are venlafaxine, otherwise known as Effexor, and duloxetine, otherwise known as Cymbalta. And these drugs can help with mood, and anything that affects neurotransmitters, affects the brain, does also have the risk of making people a little bit foggy, and these are some of the complaints. But most people who we put on these drugs say they feel better, they feel calmer. They also help with anxiety, which is a, a great, you know, tr kind of a triple, three-in-one pain, depression, and anxiety all at the same time. Um, all right, I think I had had something here about it's okay, so think about these drugs, remember them, put them in your toolbox, and it's okay to ask your doctor if uh, these drugs are acceptable for you. Sometimes a patient came, and a, fam a family came to me a few weeks ago and said, hey doc, we really hated the uh, pregabalin. It didn't work for us at w or her at, w at all. It made her, it made her quite foggy and she was having a lot of side effects from it. Do you think that duloxetine might be a good idea? And um, I had thought she might be struggling with depression, but really I hadn't, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I wasn't assessing it for sure. And I thought, huh, that's a great idea. So we put her on it. I haven't seen her back yet to see the effect, but it is, you know, sometimes a doctor may just have forgotten about a certain one. They're, your CF providers are focusing on so many different things. It's okay to suggest it and say, hey doc, is this, would you consider this? And they might say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's give it a try. Or they might say, you know, I don't think this would work for you. It might interact with this other drug that you're taking. So it's always okay to ask. All right, back to physical pain. Drugs are great, but it's also really important to treat things without drugs. You guys, uh, people with CF are on so many medications already. Um, decreasing the pill burden is something that we're always aiming to do. Massage, massage, acupuncture, ice packs, hot packs, exercise and yoga, as Siri was talking about, um, herbal remedies, these things all can help. Now they're all, you know, they're studied. The studies do not show significant clinical benefit, but that doesn't mean that they won't work for you and your pain. So give it a try, there's no risk, right? That's the great thing. Low risk, potential high benefit. And coping methods are certainly important for chronic pain that won't go away. Learn to, learning to live with your pain, learning to function with pain is a really important aspect of chronic pain. So active and accommodative techniques, problem solving, resting, distraction, self-hypnosis, self these things are things that a uh, psychologist, cognitive behavioral therapist, social workers, all of these types of people can help work on coping mechanisms. All right, so a little bit of a change, changing gears a little bit. 
Um, this was a quote from someone named Nessa Coyle. A diagnosis of a life-threatening illness jars open a door of awareness, the same door that, for most of our lives, comfortably allows us to keep thoughts about death in the background. Now, this is a very um, salient thought for people who have lived their whole lives healthy and are presented at a certain date with a diagnosis of a brand new terminal diagnosis. Cancer, for instance, is usually what we think about as something like this. But people with CF may be living with a life-threatening illness for decades. Now, we know that some people with CF are diagnosed so late, that some unfortunate cases do not live for decades, but more and more, this is the reality for people with CF. Decades of chronic illness, life-threatening, and you always have to live with it. So here is this concept of total pain. Um, pain must be conceived as something altogether more complex than the sensation alone. So that's all the nerves, the um, receptors that I was talking about earlier. More complex than sensation alone and that the biographical, social, and cultural context in which it is located and experienced are essential both to fuller understanding and to appropriate care. That's a lot of words. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these concepts. Um, the concept of total pain was more or less invented by this woman, Dom Cicely Sanders, who was the founder of modern hospice in Britain in the 1950s and 60s. So the patient population that she worked with was primarily a cancer population. She was first a nurse, later a physician, and she coined this term to capture the multiple dimensions of pain she saw in the course of her clinical work with dying people. So these are people at the tail end of life, not necessarily applicable to most of our CF population, and yet still totally applicable, I think, to the entire lifespan of somebody with chronic illness. All right, so here are the, some of the things that she taught. Much of our total pain experience is composed of our mental reaction. Pain demands the same analysis and consideration as the illness itself. Oftentimes, pain is kind of ignored at your doctor's office. They may ask it as an afterthought. Um, they may try to ignore it. They're focusing so much on everything else they have to do, the antibiotics, the airway clearance, the, the weight, the BMI, all of these things. Pain may not be on the doctor's forefront, but it may be on yours. It is the syndromes of pain rather than the syndromes of disease with which we are concerned. And such pain is a situation rather than an event. And the hardest aspect of the situation for the patient is that it seems to be meaningless as well as endless. So with uh, Dom Cicely Sanders, she, there was a shift from the emotion, initial, initial focus on the physical sensation of pain to a wider and deeper searching for signs of trouble in the social network, in the psyche, and even in the soul itself. So here we have the, the four uh, components of total pain. We talked about physical, things like bone pain, airway clearance, cough, can lead to physical sensations of pain. There's the social, the spiritual, and the psychological. So all of these non-physical elements, they do not directly cause pain. They're not touching those receptors, but they can manifest as worsening of pain. And because of this, uh, because it's a total a total concept of pain, it requires a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach. The CF center is already multidisciplinary, so the care center is already well suited. All right, so we've got, I think, the social component. We've got the work and school. We've got family, spouse, kids, and relationships. We've got finances. All of these troubles add together to cause stress. This is our, our, the case, our, our patient, our case, who was working 50 hours a week. She had two busy kids. Um, 
So that was her stress, and what kinds of that all leads, to, all focuses on the patient and the things around the patient that helps to deal with social, the social component of pain include social workers, therapists, counselors, the CF care team, but more importantly, in the day-to-day -day life, family, friends, and colleagues, the people you see every day, these people are important supports for the social component of pain. At the same time, the ones who may make it harder. Get rid of the toxic, focus on the clean and the uplifting. The spiritual component, this is really hard for uh, healthcare providers to, um, to get to. There's the existential distress, suffering, searching for meaning. Why do I have CF? Why do I have to live with this chronic illness? Everybody else beside me is fine. Um, loss, grief, and loneliness. Yesterday, um, Reed D'Amico was talking about a lot of these things as, uh, in his talk. Um, all of these center on the patient and what kinds of things surrounding the patient can help to deal with this. Pastoral care, religious communities, chaplains in the healthcare setting, the faith community, support groups, meditation. Finding spiritual peace can affect the sensation of pain significantly. And of course, the psychological component. There is no question that this can definitely worsen pain. Is there anxiety? Is there depression? These are common, common, common things in anybody with chronic illness. Is there grief due to something going on in life? New things, new changes, grief, dealing with a new diagnosis, with the loss of a loved one, and coping mechanisms. People grow up developing different types of coping mechanisms. Are your coping mechanisms strong? Are they intact? Things that can help with this are mental health assessment, and I hope that most of the CF centers you guys are working with have a mental health uh, screening going on. It's part of the CFF's uh, initiatives and goals. And in terms of treatment, medications for psychological issues and therapy. Therapy is so important, such an important part of the multidisciplinary care of anybody. All right, so back to our patient. She had negative depression and anxiety screens. I was a little amazed given everything that was going on in her life. Um, we tried duloxetine or Cymbalta for her um, since she had issues with sleep, she had pain, the, despite her negative depression and anxiety screens. So she said, yes, it helped a little bit with my sleep. It didn't change my mood at all because my mood was fine, but it made my brain foggy. It made me feel like I was in a daze. My husband said I was saying weird things. Um, so we got rid of that, and we tried pregabalin or Lyrica for a possible fibromyalgia component of pain. It worked well for her, actually. We used it for six months or a year or so, and we were able to wean it off for her. Um, she, I had recommended a sleep psychologist for, to help with her insomnia for counseling about that. Those are sometimes hard to come by. And um, she was able to increase her exercise. She started walking several miles a day with her dogs, and she said that really helped her a lot. Her work hired more staff. Her job stress improved. She cut down her hours. When does that help pain? When does that help everything in life, right? And now she is pain-free, and she has been for a year or two. Um, I think currently she did. She stopped working for a while, went back to a different job, and right now she's not working again. All right, we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about opioids. So opioids are kind of a hot topic right now. Throughout the media, you've read, you've read and heard about the opioid crisis, the national um, goals to decrease opioids, all the um, initiatives to decrease physician prescribing. I, as a physician who prescribes opioids frequently, am definitely feeling this pressure. I heard, I think I heard rumor that the drug companies are going to decrease production. It's going to make it harder for patients who need it to access them. Um, specific issues that may be related to people with CF and using opioids. Um, our patients, will they be too out of it? Will she be too out of it to talk to her family if she's on these drugs? You know, especially after surgery, something like that. It's a cough suppressant. She needs some airway clearance all the time. Morphine will decrease her respiratory drive, um, 
Maybe the patient is being considered for transplant. The transplant team won't like it. She's going to get constipated. She'll be too drowsy to do her therapies. She wants to live. I don't want to take away her fight because giving somebody opioids is like saying that they're dying. Lots of questions, lots of concerns, lots of myths. So I'll talk a little bit, just a little background, what are opioids to begin with? And I prefer the word opioids as opposed to narcotics because opioids are the class of drugs that these medications are and narcotics sort of, well not sort of, they do mean just basically illegal drugs. So we prefer the technical term opioids. So opioids are medications that act on the opioid receptors in the brain and spinal cord to reduce the intensity of pain signal perception. So the nerves are sending signals up to the brain to say there is pain going on. Sometimes there is you know, a real physical cause of pain, sometimes there's not. They also affect brain areas that control emotion. Now that's important in a variety of ways because it can help with coping or it can cause maladaptive coping when people love the, the high that they get from these drugs. This is the next um, point. They, the opioids affect reward regions in the brain, causing the euphoria or the high that underlies the potential for misuse and addiction. Um, so, we've got same patients, different settings, different scenarios. Um, there are reasons to use and reasons not to use the drugs. Um, opioids can treat the pain and dyspnea. They are appropriate for moderate and severe pain at the end of life. However, there are side effects, there are transplant concerns, and it is very important to consider the concerns and myths versus the facts. What do we know about the use of opioids for pain and other distressing symptoms in CF? There's a lot of questions. So when we talk about the approach to treating pain in CF, the picture on the left-hand side here, um, this is the, the WHO pain ladder. And it talks about what you use for mild pain, which is your non-opioid. Those were the NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Tylenol particularly that we were talking about, and adjuvant therapy. Those are the additional, the uh, antidepressants, the neuropathic agents. And then opioids might be considered in mild to moderate pain. The weak opioids are multimodal fixed dose. So those are like the combination pills that you might have seen, particularly Norco and Vicodin, which are hydrocodone combination pills. And with moderate to severe pain is when you might consider what they call a strong opioid. Those are things like morphine, oxycodone, hydromorphone, and the ones that are const constantly talked about for their addictive potential. Um, so specifically for people with CF, NSAIDs and nephrotoxic antibiotics do not map, do not go well together, right? So nephrotoxic antibiotics include vancomycin for MRSA, tobramycin for pseudomonas. Those are probably the two most common that we think about as having the potential to cause risk to the kidney. And NSAIDs, that's ibuprofen and naproxen, also have uh, the potential for risk to the kidney. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. The high-dose ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory therapy. That's not a, a treatment that I generally prescribed to my patients, um, but it has been recommended, and it's very high dose. If you think about, so the dose that is recommended is high dose ibuprofen for anti-inflammatory is 1,600 milligrams a day, uh, 16 milligrams per dose. I think it was two or three times a day. I can't remember. Um, compared with one pill of ibuprofen over the counter that you get, the Advil or the Motrin or whatever you get over the counter at Walgreens is 200 milligrams. So that's eight of them, I think, two or three times a day. It's much higher than the normal recommended dose of ibuprofen, which is 2,400 milligrams a day total in divided doses. Um, so you add that, you have that consideration for how that might hurt the kidneys. And then acetaminophen or Tylenol is a great drug used in low doses, um, but it does have the potential to cause liver damage. Um, that's one of the most common fears we have about acetaminophen. When I work in the ICU, we're always really, really scared about people who overdose on Tylenol, intentionally or unintentionally, um, due to chronic severe pain, um, because there is severe damage to the liver, which can cause really, really awful side effects. And people with CF who have CF-associated liver disease, elevated liver enzymes, bilirubin, people who are taking ursodiol, risk to the 
risk to the liver, um, really need to be careful with how much Tylenol is taken. And the maximum Tylenol dose is 2,000 milligrams a day for anybody with um, any liver disease. So that's four extra strength Tylenols a day. And extra strength Tylenol is 500 milligrams, and a regular one is 325, or 3,000 milligrams total for anybody with a normal liver. And then, of course, we're concerned about drug interactions and increased risk of adverse effects of some of the ad adjuvant drugs. So it is very important to employ all of the non-pharmacologic pain management strategies I was talking about earlier in our consideration of total pain. All right, so the indications for the use of opioids in CF, moderate to severe pain. Um, these are, this is very bad pain. You got a rib fracture, you got a pneumothorax, you got acute pancreatitis, you've got nephrolithiasis, it's a long fancy word for a kidney stone. Uh, Post-procedure operative pain. When you've got this bad pain, don't be scared to take it. I had a recent patient, a CF patient, who was in for a kidney stone surgery a couple weeks ago. I, he said he was being a martyr. He was being, he was being too strong. He says, "I just need a little bit of Tylenol." I said, "You know, you had surgery this morning. You need to do your airway clearance this evening. You have to take at least a Norco to get you through your airway clearance." He said, "Fine." And the next day, he said, "Yeah, doc, you were right. I needed it." I was able to tolerate my airway clearance with that medicine. So that's acute pain, moderate to severe chronic pain. So this is where it gets a little complicated. Yes, opioids are very important for chronic pain. Addiction is also very scary. Um, if there is pain that limitates, limits participation in therapies, especially during exacerbations. And is there shortness of breath in patients with advanced disease? Opioids do help with the sensation of shortness of breath. Um, so it's really, really important as people are entering respiratory failure, if they're using a BiPAP to help with breathing at nighttime, that's a time when opioids can really improve the quality of life and should not be withheld even if lung transplant is a consideration. And that's here, pain and dyspnea at the end of life. So what are some of the side effects we're worried about with opioids? Constipation. So with CF, it's always an issue talking about poop. Are you having diarrhea? Are you having constipation? How many bowel movements a day? Your uh, CF care team's probably asking you about this at every visit, and every patient has a different bowel habit. So those who have malabsorption and chronic or chronic constipation, um, these do increase the likelihood of constipation with the use of opioids. So it's important to monitor stool output, ensure adequate hydration. Why is that important? Make sure the stool has enough water to help bulk it up and to help it move along, decrease the pain. And Because you never want to worsen pain um, with pain medicines. And it does happen. I've seen patients with chronic severe pain, take opioids and then, you know, arm pain or leg pain or something like that. They're on these opioids and all of a sudden they've got this horrible belly pain because they get constipated. Um, so a bowel regimen is important. And again, if you are a CF patient who is prone to uh, diarrhea and malabsorption, it may be different for you. Um, but polyethylene glycol, otherwise known as Miralax, is a great treatment or prevention of constipation, stimulant laxatives, suppositories, enemas if needed. I personally prefer to stick to the oral um, bowel regimens because they're easier to take. All right, and then um, in terms of the use of opioids and CF, the side effects, uh, Respiratory depression is always a concern. There's actually no published data to suggest that patients with CF are at risk of respiratory depression with thoughtful, appropriate dosing. So that means that the dosing is for pain and not for getting high. Now, if somebody starts to shift their reasons for use, then respiratory depression can be a concern. Cough suppression. Will these medications c decrease the cough and decrease their ability to uh, clear their airways? It could, but that's why it's so important to maintain a good airway clearance regimen. Do the huff cough after airway clearance therapy, force a cough. Um, the opioids will not suppress a forced cough. And then sedation, again, if the dosing is appropriate, um, a person using opioids should not become sedated. 
It should only be to treat the symptoms that are needed, minimum dose needed. All right, so here's a complication. CF and lung, and lung transplant. Um, and are these medications okay to use when lung transplant is being considered? Um, there's a woman in um, Toronto, her name is Dr. Rebecca Coleman, who has done a lot of studies about palliative care, opioid use, and lung transplant. So this is center to center dependent. Some centers say, you know, if you're on opioids at all, we will not even consider you for transplant. I think that's a little severe. Other centers say, you know, we're going to take it on a case by case basis. If you are using opioids appropriately, you're using them for management of pain, we will work with you. We will make sure that you are safe and um, we, we will consider you for transplant. Um, now, if there's addiction concerns, if there are abuse concerns, that's a different story. But it is, again, a case-by-case -case evaluation in some centers, and that's what I would advocate for. Um, there, were, there, there was an um, informal survey of 50 lung transplant physicians about their use of opioids in lung transplant candidates. And some of them said, you know, no way, zero tolerance. Some people say we will have rare exceptions. Some people said minimize if able. I mean, that's minimizing if able is always the best uh, case scenario and support if stable. So the experience basically said use common sense. Um, and there were also some concerns about the use of opioids um, preventing extubation after lung transplant. How is post-operative pain going to be managed? A lung transplant is not a small surgery and is quite painful afterwards. How are we going to manage that? If they're needing opioids all the time, are we going to be able to control their pain? So um, there, a partnership is required with people who are experienced with pain management. Um, so some questions in terms of lung transplant. Do opioids interfere with participation in physical therapy or pulmonary rehab? Could appropriate use of opioids actually improve and promote participation? Absolutely. Pain is treated. The sensation of dyspnea isn't there. So opioids do also, you know, they affect the respiratory centers in the brain, which can affect the sensation of dyspnea, the feeling of being short of breath. And if that feeling is not there, it can improve the abil your ability to exercise and participate, participate in rehab. Are we capable of managing post-op pain in people with um, who are chronically on opioids? Well, a CF provider or a transplant surgeon may not be, but in conjunction with a pain specialist, a palliative care physician, people who are comfortable with these meds, absolutely pain can be controlled and safely. Um, is it possible to wean patients from opioids after lung transplant? Hopefully, but maybe not. Maybe there still are sources of pain, and this can be managed on a case-by-case -case basis. What if we deny opioids to patients who are listed for transplant and they don't survive to transplant? Does that mean that their last weeks or months were spent in excruciating suffering that wasn't necessary? So these are all questions that um, need to be addressed in the consideration during this time. So there are not a lot of answers. Um, this is a study that Dr. Coleman um, from Toronto uh, did. She, there was a, she did a retrospective review of transplant candidates who received a palliative care consultation. And there were 38 of 50, so that's more than three quarters, who used opioids chronically pre-transplant. Um, and there were no zero, zero episodes of clinically important toxicity or respiratory depression. So that adds to the, or, uh, the concept that these medications can be used safely. And there was a trend toward increased exertion during exercise sessions post-opioid. So that means they took an opioid, they went to an exercise session, and they did better. It wasn't statistically significant. It was a small sample. If you did 100 or 1,000 patients, which I don't, it would take a long time to get 1,000 patients into a CF post-transplant study. Um, so, but possibly, and um, of, the, of 30 patients who actually went through transplant during this time period, only seven of them, 
23%, so less than a quarter, required opioids one month after discharge. So that's great news. 75% of them weaned off of their opioids over one month. So the conclusions are opioids can be safely prescribed pre-transplant without compromising eligibility. That doesn't mean every transplant center will agree, but it means that maybe if this is a problem, then consider another center. All right, so um, regarding safe uh, prescribing, CDC recommendations. CDC is a center for disease control, and we take, get a lot of our uh, um, guidelines from them. So who will provide, prescribe, and monitor use? A CF provider, that's your CF care team, if they are comfortable and appropriately trained, a pain specialist, a pain specialist can be trained through physical medicine, anesthesia, or palliative care, um, especially if there's a history of substance abuse or addiction um, in the family, not even in the individual. Um, if the person is unresponsive to typical pain therapies or if there, is, um, if there are increased concerns about side effects in a particular individual. A palliative care provider, that's what I am, um, in the setting of advanced disease or the end of life or if there are concerns about side effects or symptom clusters. And I, honestly, I think that anybody with CF is a candidate for palliative care because you, uh, anybody with CF is living with a serious illness their whole lives. It does not have to be at the end of life. Um, and can side effects be managed? Proactive plan, so as I was talking about before, Use a bowel regimen ahead of time. Increase your airway clearance. Don't wait until the side effects occur. And utilize the multidisciplinary CF team or other appropriate providers to address mental health concerns, psychosocial issues, safety concerns. All right, so what about these concerns? Dependence, addiction, abuse, and misuse. We'll define these words first. So dependence is a physiological state. It means that if something is taken away, then side effects will occur. And that's not just for opioids or medications with uh, abuse potential. That could also be true for something like a blood pressure medication. Um, for people with CF, I would argue to say that people with CF are dependent on their airway clearance, their pancreatic enzymes. If you are a person who uses pancreatic enzymes and you stop them, what happens the next day or after the next meal. That's physiological dependence, and it's okay. It means your medication, your body needs that medication. Um, now with opioids, it means if you take them away abruptly, you will experience withdrawal symptoms, um, but those can be managed and they can be taken care of in a gradual, slow way. Uh, abuse is a pretty generic term, so it can be used for somebody who, but gene, uh, generally when we use the word abuse, it's somebody who takes a medication for the purpose of pleasure, um, for the purpose of the side effects, for the purpose of getting high, for the euphoria. Misuse is somebody who uses the drug as it is not prescribed. Now most commonly that's you know, oh, you've got a lot of pain today. I've got some pain. I've got some pain meds left over from that surgery I had last year. Why don't you take one of my pills? Is that okay? Yes and no, right? Just don't tell me about it. One pill, it's probably okay. If you're starting to do this every day, if you're taking four times more than you were prescribed, that's also considered misuse. If I give you 30 pills a month and you need 60 and you're getting your 30, the extra 30 from somewhere else, that's not really okay. So the misuse, there's a spectrum of what's really acceptable and unacceptable. And addiction, um, that's the old word. The new word, the, the new medical term we're using is a drug use disorder. And that's when there becomes a, the, there are cravings when the medication is taken away, not just the physiological withdrawal, but a psychological withdrawal. It's when there are social and health consequences. You know, you start missing school, you start missing work, you're doing, you know, people start doing things to get money, to get the drugs that they need. That's addiction. That's not okay. It needs treatment now with an addiction specialist, which unfortunately addiction specialists are few and far between. But um, so those are the different definitions of these words. Does prescribing opioids cause addiction? Absolutely not. Um, it can contribute to the patients, however. So you see these circles, and these are, I've got, we've got this big circle of all patients taking opioids. 
Of those, a small circle are misusers, and even smaller are abusers, and even smaller are addicts, right? So new misuse is about 12 to 15 percent, and new addiction or abuse is less than 3 percent. Not common, but still definitely needs to be considered. Are people with CF at greater risk than the general population? Well, they do have a chronic disease. There is a huge symptom burden, and there's a higher prevalence of anxiety and depression among CF populations than the general. So if you take those in each, each of those in isolation, then maybe, maybe not. But just to be concerned about them. So how do we identify patients at risk for misuse, abuse, and addiction? Screening for risk factors. So personal or family histories. A family history is really important in terms of working on prevention of a personal history of substance misuse, abuse, or addiction, a personal history of anxiety or depression, and young age. People who are younger have uh, less, uh, less control, less coping, less inhibition, so are at higher risk than somebody perhaps a little bit older. Validated screening tools, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't use these, um, but they are very important. Um, but in terms of monitoring, so regular assessment, when you uh, these are things that I ask of all my patients who are on opioids. Is pain management effective? Do we need to address pain from other modalities? Are there psychological? Are there social? Are there spiritual issues we need to address? Do we need to use some adjunctive medications? Is this improving your activity level? Is your function improved? Is it getting you to school? Is it getting you to do your airway clearance? Are there side effects, adverse effects? Anything bothersome or worrisome? And are there aberrant behaviors? So that's when we're getting worried and we have to be extra cautious. People may do, um, may have, uh, um, oh, just, uh, making sure thing, that you're using your uh, medications as they are prescribed. All right, so in terms of an approach to the use of opioids in CF, it's important to, one, thoughtfully consider the indications and remembering the potential for interaction of multiple distressing symptoms, assess the risk for misuse, abuse, and addiction, establish goals around the use of opioids, uh, monitor closely reassessing need, efficacy and side effects, and uh, speak, seeking specialist assistance when needed, particularly for complicated cases with people who were having difficulty trusting, with people who were having concerns about diversion, selling, giving away, misuse. Opioid contracts are very important, and if your doctor asks you for one, don't take it as a, as a uh, sign, just take it as something that your doctor is doing for safety for your safety especially. I generally do opioid contracts with every single one of my patients for whom I prescribe regular opioids. So there are rules when you can ask for a refill, when you can get them, what happens if your drugs are lost or stolen, you need to file a police report, things like that. And we as a entire CF community should promote research and provider communication about the use of opioids in CF.